Hello everyone, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and I'm at the RAF Museum in London. And this is of course a great place to have a look at some of those classic aircraft from World War I, World War II and into the Cold War period. So you know what, while we're here, why don't we pop inside and see what we can find. Today we are looking at the Hawker Hurricane, a fighter aircraft from World War II. This Mark I is one of the oldest surviving Hawker Hurricanes, so after the walk around I will talk a bit about its history. The Hawker Hurricane is a single seat low wing monoplane fighter aircraft that saw service during World War II in the Allied Air Forces, predominantly with British and Commonwealth squadrons. It was also used as a fighter bomber, featuring rockets, cannons or bombs. However, this was not done with the Mark I versions you see here. Now the basic dimensions of the aircraft are the following. It is 9.6 meters in length, stands at 4 meters and spans 12.2 meters. And empty it weighs around 2,300 kilograms, going up to 3,000 kilograms fully loaded. Starting with the walk around then, up front you are of course greeted by a propeller. This is a Rotol three-bladed constant speed propeller. The blades are 3.3 meters in diameter and have a pitch range of 35 degrees, going from 21 degrees to 56 degrees. Above the engine, two panels cover this section. The engine panel is at the front, while the fuel tank panel is behind it. The three exhaust stacks bundle the exhaust of two cylinders each, sending it rearwards, which brings us of course then to the engine. And originally this aircraft you see here was powered by a Rolls-Royce Merlin III, a V12 cylinder engine, giving it a maximum of 1280 horsepower. This engine was replaced at some point during this specific aircraft's life, most likely post-war, with another Merlin. Now below the engine you will see the carburetor air intake right here. And next to it there is the electric starter socket. Below the fuel tank cowling panel, the engine glycol coolant tank can be found. As well as a small reserve fuel tank of 127 liters. The firewall is set between those. A filler cap for the glycol cooling can also be found on the starboard side, while the reserve tank fuel cap is out of sight. A inertia starter connector is found here as well, as on the other side. Before we move on to the wing, I want you to pay close attention to the composite construction of the Hawker Hurricane. The aircraft itself was reminiscent of some of those older biplane designs by the same company, like for example the Hawker Fury. This was a conscious design choice and something I want to talk about again in a future video. For now, notice how the front part of the aircraft is covered in the already mentioned panels, giving quick access to the vital parts for maintenance. The aft section, however, starting behind the cockpit, is covered in fabric. Initially, this was done on the wings as well in the first production models, but as you can see here, we have a stressed skin metal wing that was introduced soon after production started. Moving on towards the wing then, you will find the main armament for 303 Browning machine guns per wing. In total, this gives the aircraft eight machine guns. And when this aircraft came out in the late 1930s, this was a very heavy armament. And this was also somewhat better placed than the spaced out configuration found on the Supermarine Spitfire, which was another British plane that came out roughly at the same time. However, as the war progressed, it was soon realized that this weapon was indeed a little bit too light and thus the RAF started to increasingly field 20mm Hispano cannons once the early kings had been worked out. The wing itself is essentially a two-piece design. About a meter from the fuselage, the wing is attached to the inner portion. On the inner wing, notice the fuel cap for the main fuel tank. Each wing tank held 150 liters. On the outer wing, you will find four large access panels for the guns. Each gun had 350 rounds for a total capacity of 2,800 machine gun rounds. The casings are ejected via small holes on the bottom side of the wing. Along the leading edge, you will find a landing light worked into the wing. 
then the navigational light. The aileron is fabric covered. On the bottom side you will also see the access panels to control cables and the lever mechanisms. The flaps are simple split flaps, hydraulically operated and deployed to 80 degrees at the highest setting. The flaps run along the trailing edge of the inner and outer wing portion, so they actually split and you can find the connection between the two right here. The landing gear connected to the inner portion of the wing folds towards the fuselage. We will have a closer look at that later on. Below the pilot, the radiator and oil cooler with an adjustable flap. The black and white paint on the underside is an early version of visual IFF, that's identification friend or foe, for ground-based defenses, having a similar function actually to the later invasion stripes used during D-Day or the prominent use of yellow among German squadrons. A signaling light and two parachute flare doors are found just after this, followed by access doors in the underfairing. The cockpit canopy slides rearwards, with the pilot being protected up front by a thick armored windscreen. Behind him would also be a roughly 8mm thick armor plate. It should be noted that when the Mark I came out, there was none of this armor installed in the aircraft, and this was really something that only started in May 1940 and continued into June and July, and of course August and September of that year during the Battle of Britain. Originally, none of this armor was installed in the Hawker Hurricane. The panels on either side of the cockpit are breakout exit panels that could be quickly removed in times of need. Before we continue, notice once again the metal coverings of the front section shown here next to the walkaway on the wing. As we look at the aft section, the difference in covering materials becomes clear. Equipment like the radios are stored just behind the seat where they are still accessible, leaving the aft section largely empty. Thus the aerial mast for the antenna is perhaps the most exciting feature between the front section and the tail. A lifting point can also be found close to the tail section. The tail, the stabilizers and the control surfaces are also fabric covered. The elevator hooks over into the horizontal stabilizer providing balance. A trim tab is also provided. The rudder also hooks over the vertical stabilizer and has an installed navigational light. It has a small aerial attachment for the antenna running from the previously shown mast. This is positioned exactly so that a rudder deflection does not flex the antenna during the movement. The rudder trim and a door on the port side allows access to the cables and the controls. The tailwheel pivots but is not retractable. This would originally have been a Dunlop 4 inch for 3.5 inch wheel. Moving back along the fuselage towards the pilot, you will see a footstep that can be pushed inwards into a stored position, where you can also once again see the rails on which the canopy can be moved forward and aft. The wing is similar to the starboard example, with a different colored navigational light of course. A second landing light is also installed and the armament mirrors the starboard configuration. However, there should also be a pitot tube on this wing. The gear features a simple retraction towards the fuselage and is stored well in front of the radiator and oil cooler intake. Because the gear was of a more solid construction and also because it was set inside the wings and retracted towards the fuselage and extended away from it, the Hawker Hurricane was a lot more stable on the ground than comparable machines of the time, like for example the Supermarine Spitfire, which had a narrower undercarriage fully deployed, as well as the B of 109. Here, originally, the wheels would have been Dunlop 8 inch for 10 inch wheels. On the leading edge at the wing root, a filler cap for the oil tank is installed. This oil tank is only on the port side and it holds 34 liters. And next to the engine on the port side here, the electrical generator is installed and the inertia starter connector is found just below it. For the object's history, we must travel back to 1938. Like many of Hawker's aircraft, this Hurricane was built not by the Hawker company, but by the Gloucester Aircraft Company on a subcontract. 
ordered in 1938. It was built at Brockworth near Gloucester as one of the first in a batch totaling 500 aircraft. It was given the serial P2617. Its early history is largely uneventful, being shuffled from one maintenance unit to the next. By April 1940, however, it was given to number 607 Squadron Royal Auxiliary Air Force, stationed in France near Abbeville, which was predominantly equipped with Gloucester Gladiators at the time. This is where the aircraft received its designation AFF. As the German offensive into the Low Countries and France opened in May 1940, the aircraft saw brief combat over Belgium and France, but number 607 squadron soon had to relocate further west, abandoning most of the equipment. Briefly based near Bologna, number 607 squadron flew back to the British islands on the 20th of May 1940, 10 days after the German offensive had commenced. A few days later, this aircraft was damaged and repaired, but it seems to have only flown one sortie during the Battle of Britain. It was then transferred to number one squadron, a Canadian unit, and used on coastal patrols. By November 1940, it had less than 16 flight hours and was damaged again in a landing accident. This would not be the last time P-2617 was damaged on landing. After repairs, it was sent to a training school where it was damaged again, twice on landing. It remained as a training aircraft until May 1942, when it was damaged again. It was repaired and moved into storage. In April 1944, it was already selected as an aircraft to be preserved by the Air Historical Branch. After the war, it appeared in various movies, such as Battle of Britain, although it wasn't flying in that one. Touring the country as a display piece, it finally arrived at the museum in the 1970s, where it was painted into the colors and markings of number 607 squadron, just as it had originally borne during the war. I hope you enjoyed this walk around, and if you did, please consider joining viewers like yourself who are already supporting my channel via Patreon or channel memberships. If you are a Patreon or channel member, make sure you check your updates, as I have posted a flight manual to this aircraft some time ago. I would also like to thank the RAF Museum for the great access they gave me on this machine, and specifically Ashley, Steve and Chris over at the museum. If you enjoy looking at aircraft like this one, consider visiting the RAF Museum to see this and other aircraft yourself. And as always, I hope you have a great day and see you in the sky.